What's going on? My name is John Joe Lyons and today I'm here to present to you my review for the Necromantic Trilogy. Written and directed by Jorg Bergerit, Necromantic stars all of these people. Sharing a mutual fascination for the dead and the macabre, the Berlin misfits Betty and Robert are in for a big surprise that will soon broaden their horizons. When Rob takes a job as a cleaner at the Aftermath Cleanup Agency, little by little right under everyone's noses, the obsessed new employee amasses a rich and grotesque collection of severed limbs and human organs. And what is even more fascinating, their dreams will finally come true when Rob brings home a putrid cadaver to amaze his girlfriend. Nevertheless, can Robert handle this bizarre and gruesome menage a trois? I've been planning to review this series for a while, since Begotten really, and it's one I've been putting off which I'm sure surprises none of you. I think it's safe to say this is a bit of a level up. That being said, the whole purpose of this channel is to dig into the most off-putting, abhorrent, vile and reprehensible that the horror genre has to offer. So here we are. It said the director never intended on being a filmmaker and the first Necromantic was a film made in response to Germany's incredibly strict censorship of cinema. Bearing this in mind throughout helps us to understand the purpose behind the film and recognise just how funny it is. Known the world over as being the first romantic movie for necrophiles, this is Necromantic. Cut to a shot of a woman having a wee, finishing up and joining a partner back in the car. He has a moan about her delaying their trip and orders her to get the map out as he wants to know just how long they've got left to travel. She's unable to find their location, so the man tries to help, taking his eyes off the road and causing them to crash. Come on, take my... Cut to some time later as a cleanup crew attends the crash site, finding the man dead in the car and the woman cut in half. They bag him up and head back to the office. The team leader has a moan to his boss about the main character Rob wanting to fire him, but the boss says to give him a chance and dismisses him. Back at Rob's apartment, we see organs in jars as he adds an eyeball he stole from the corpses earlier to his collection. <laughs> He then pulls a stolen heart out of his bag and puts it in a jar as we see more body parts he's trying to preserve. Interestingly, all the pieces that he chooses to keep relate to love or intimacy in some way. He is then joined by his girlfriend Betty, who observes his collection before having a bath in bloody water. Meanwhile, Rob watches the TV as a psychiatrist speaks on the topic of arachnophobia and ways to overcome your phobias. Cut to a dreamlike sequence as Rob remembers his father slaughtering his pet rabbit. These scenes are juxtaposed with scenes of Rob performing an autopsy which is interesting when paired with the real gore of the rabbit helping the brain to connect the two, which helps seeing as the human autopsy scene isn't super convincing. Cut to a man in his garden shooting birds as his neighbour picks apples. The man accidentally shoots his neighbour dead and then we cut to him taking the body somewhere in a wheelbarrow. Cut to the cleaning company getting called out to the scene. A detective pulls out a cigarette and then tells the crew to take the body as he's done gathering evidence. The crew make jokes and then pull the badly decomposed body out of the pond before bagging it up. Cut to the van ride back where the manager announces it's the end of the day and tells Rob to dispose of the body as the rest leave. Rob gets in the front seat and is about to drive away when he has another idea. Stealing the corpse and popping it in his trunk before driving home. Back at the flat, Rob presents Betty with the body. Okay, listen, before we go any further, I just want to let you know this is where things start to get really f***ing wild. This is your very, very last chance to turn away. Okay, here we go. They both slide their hands over the slimy corpse with Rob paying special attention to the one remaining eyeball. Cut to Rob soaring a length of pipe. Oh dear. Cut to the bedroom as Betty jams the pipe into the body's groin creating a penis which she covers with a condom. Because the last thing you want is to catch a disease. They then have a threesome which is shot and scored to be as conventionally romantic as possible which is f***ing 
Hilarious. We then see Rob suck the eyeball out of the body before spitting it back into the socket. They continue to have sex, finishing on a shot of Rob touching Betty's leg. Cut to a giant steak being fried in a tiny pan. Cut to the couple eating dinner as the body hangs on the wall, dripping putrid liquid onto plates positioned below. <laughs> We've all been there. Cut to Rob's office as the team leader finds foul-smelling overalls in his locker and then scolds him for being late again before dragging him off to see the boss. Cut to Rob's apartment as Betty lays with the body in bed reading it a romance novel. She asks the corpse if it could feel the love in the story, then makes it Cut to the office as Rob is fired, then back to the flat as he informs Betty of his termination. She then berates Bob, calling him a wimp and chastising him for not standing up for himself. She then threatens to leave him for someone with money. We then cut to some time later as Rob looks around their flat for Betty and we see he's bought her a cat as a gift. Rob then finds a letter from Betty advising that she's left and taking the corpse with her. Rob then feeds the cat a human heart while looking at pictures of Betty before burning it and killing the cat in a fit of rage. Cut to Rob bathing in the cat's blood and entrails as the body hangs above him. Cut to Rob at the movies as he looks at a poster for a slasher film. After checking with the clerk, he buys a ticket and a beer and then takes his seat. Then with Rob, we start to watch the film within the film, which features a man chasing down a woman and running his knife over her bare skin. It's important to note the reaction of the audience to the violence in the film in that there is none. The sound of the film playing juxtaposed against the audience's seemingly uninterested expressions denotes a feeling of desensitization. A feeling that no doubt we are all experiencing at this point after witnessing a sex scene which can only be described as... challenging? I mean, I got there, but wasn't easy. After watching Necromantic, it's kind of hard to be bothered by the gore in a Friday the 13th movie. This could also represent the desensitization of the German nation and an affront to the notoriously strict German film censors. With the film still playing, we see a depressed looking Rob leave. At home, Rob attempts to overdose washing pills down with liquor before drifting off into a dream. We find ourselves in a field with a body bag which rips open from the inside to reveal a half decomposed Rob. He's joined by a woman in white who presents him with a box containing a severed human head. The two then play catch with the head to romantic music. Rob then dances with some guts or possibly a spinal cord and we dissolve back to the real world. Cut to a couple of sex workers having a chat. Rob then pulls up requesting something special which the second woman accepts but says it will cost more. Cut to a foggy graveyard as the two have sex on a headstone. Suddenly Rob is unable to perform and the woman begins to laugh leading him to strangle her to death and then violate her body post mortem. Cut to Rob waking up in the morning next to the dead woman. They're discovered by the gravedigger who drops his shovel in shock. Rob then picks up the shovel and decapitates the man sending blood gushing up into the crisp morning air. <laughs> <laughs> Cut to Rob sitting in a field looking at a caterpillar and presumably reconsidering his life choices. Then him nailing a Jesus figure to a cross and then back to the field as Rob runs through the brush in joy. Cut to Rob's apartment as he picks up a knife and lays on his bed and we get the most famous scene of the film. Rob pulls out his stabs himself in the stomach, starts and then starts blood. All while romantic music plays. These scenes are intercut with the reversed footage of the rabbit being slaughtered. We then cut to Rob's grave as he finally rests. Suddenly a shovel digs into the dirt and a woman's high heel penetrates the grave before we cut to credits. The end. Part 2 tells the story of a female nurse desperately trying to hide her feelings of necrophilia from her new boyfriend, all the while still in the possession of the corpse of the first movie's hero. Cut to a black and white flashback of Rob's death before cutting to shots of buildings in disrepair. This transitions to a church graveyard as we see flashes of a woman named Monica as she goes inside and searches for her prize. Cut to Rob's grave as Monica approaches and starts to dig. She eventually gets to the coffin, opens it up and reveals the now decomposing body of Rob. She takes him back to her apartment, somehow without being noticed by anyone. And as she drags the body into the house, we get another one of those 360 shots, a replica of the same shot used in The Death King. In this film, the technique is used to show us the layout of Monica's flat and all the ornaments of death that adorn her walls. She then unwraps Rob, sparks a cigarette and sits with him. Cut to a man named Mark on his way to work. 
in a departure from the previous film's single lead narrative, this film will follow both Monica and Mark, which is a welcome addition and something I would have liked to have seen in the original, perhaps splitting the story between Rob and Betty. Cut back to Monica as she kisses Rob and I'm not gonna lie, it's pretty f***ing rough to watch. The body is super gooey and leaking. Not f***ing good at all, man. Inspecting his self-inflicted stab wound and caressing his rotting body before removing his trousers. Monica then removes her top as she approaches him and we fade to black. Cut to Mark as we discover his job is dubbing porn films. Porn foley artists are a thing. Who knew? Cut back to Monica now having sex with Rob, or at least attempting to. I think the best way to explain this scene is to quote the Wikipedia synopsis. It states, The implication is that the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak. Super weak. Like, slippy slidey weak. Unable to reach completion, Monica runs to the bathroom to vomit. She washes up and takes a long hard look at herself in the mirror. Presumably thinking, what the actual f*** am I up to here? Now, remember at the start when we all collectively sighed at the fact that it was Monica digging up Rob and not Betty? Well. Cut back to the graveyard as Betty stands above Rob's open grave. So missed. Is it me? Or is that really f***ing funny? Cut back to Monica as she tries to air out the flat. She lays Rob down and puts out some flowers, but they don't last long. Cut to Mark on the phone arranging a cinema date with a friend. Cut to Monica taking selfies with Rob with the whole scene being a perfect metaphor for what it's like to be the partner of a social media influencer. Cut to Mark outside the cinema when his friend doesn't show up. Dejected, he instead offers his spare ticket to a random passerby. And that's where Mark meets Monica. We see the pair enjoying the film, then briefly cut outside to see Mark's friend has arrived having missed him. Much like Betty having missed Rob. Cut to Mark making eggs for Monica. They then talk about Mark's job and Monica's job as a nurse as they get to know each other. Cut to a recording session and then to Mark and Monica as they go on a romantic date to a fairground. Not only is part two a much better produced film, but it's also a much more traditionally romantic film. With the necrophilia taking a backseat to Mark and Monica's burgeoning relationship, it's really rather sweet. Cut to Monica in the kitchen. She's decided to break up with Rob, so puts on an apron, fixes herself a drink, pops on some rubber gloves and draws for the saw. She then goes to work dismembering Rob. The thing that bothers me the most is how gooey this guy is. We then watch as Monica saws Rob's head off. And for a good little while too. <laughs> that thing is jammed on there. She then cuts off his genitals. Cut off Check. Cut to a knackered Monica as she has a rest and a smoke. She then puts the genitals on a plate, covers them with cling film and sticks them in the fridge. Cut to Monica eating a meal and then to Rob's grave now filled with the bagged up remains. Cut to Monica showing Mark pictures of dead relatives which leads to them having sex. Although Mark seems to enjoy it, Monica is left dissatisfied and questions her choice to lead a normal life. Cut to the couple in a tiny bed as Mark gets up to make some food. In the kitchen he discovers the severed f***ing balls on a plate. And at this point I'd just like to pause the movie and ask you, viewer, what would you do in this situation? Uh, Mon, can we have a word? Who severed the balls is this on a plate in your fridge? Cause it ain't mine. On the one hand, Monica is interesting, intelligent, beautiful, has a hobby, right? And on the other hand, she has a severed f***ing balls on a plate in her fridge. You know? Cut to Monica dreaming about her singing with a piano player. And check out the f me eyes that this piano player is throwing at us. That might be the thing that disturbed me the most in this entire movie. What is he thinking? <laughs> what is going through that guy's head? I'm not, I'm not good. I'm not comfortable. I don't like it. Cut to Monica taking a picture of Mark hanging upside down. He requests to be let down and Monica kisses him before obliging. We then cut to Mark in a cafe where he meets the girl who was late earlier. He expresses his worries about Monica to the friend and then later to another friend at a bar. Mark then gets so drunk he passes out and we cut to his dream. We see Monica walking in a field when she comes across both Mark and Rob's heads in the ground. She passes by the screaming Mark and kisses Rob then places a box over Mark's head and stomps on it. Cut to Mark being woken up and chucked out of the bar by the bartender. Cut back to Monica's as she hangs out with a group of other like-minded individuals. They're watching footage of an animal autopsy with Rob's head sitting on the coffee table in front of them. Mark drops by unexpectedly with a pizza, forcing Monica to hide the severed head and turn off the film. Her friends leave and the couple eat with Mark asking what they were up to. Monica says they were watching a videotape, but when Mark asks to see it, she refuses. He presses the matter until she relents, but when he sees it, he's disgusted. He says to watch this for enjoyment is perverse, and Monica compares it to the porn films he has to watch for his job. 
Cut to later as Monica asks Mark to come over tomorrow evening so she can explain it to him. Cut to Monica taking a walk on a beach, then putting her human biology figure back together. Then looking at pictures of Mark and Rob apparently battling with her sexual desires and her need to live a normal life. Cut to Mark arriving at the house where the two start to have sex. And it seems that Monica has made her decision. She has chosen Mark. <laughs> Hey, uh, Monica. What are you reaching for there, bud? Hmm? <laughs> In a sudden turn of events, Monica brings a meat cleaver down on Mark's neck with buckets of blood immediately pouring from the wound while she continues to have sex with him. <laughs> Good lord. I'm not going to be able to show any of this, so here's what happens. Monica manages to decapitate him as she and the walls around her are drenched in blood. She then zip ties his penis, runs to get Rob's head, plonks it on Mark's shoulders and jumps right back on the c**k, finally being able to reach orgasm. She lays down satisfied and kisses Rob as she catches her breath. Cut to an undetermined amount of time later at the hospital as Monica is informed that she is pregnant. This thing look good, she's in trouble. The end. Oh, Mark. Poor f now, originally, that was going to be the end of the run-through section, but then I got a message from Martin Trafford. Martin Trafford is the artist responsible for the artwork of the first two Necromantic films, the comic book art, and the story of the comic book, having co-wrote it with Jorg himself. According to Martin, this is the closest we're ever going to get to a Necromantic 3, so let's check it out. Cut to Berlin 2011 as we're introduced to Eddie, a 20 year old grave digger who admittedly prefers the company of the dead to the living. He's getting ready for bed when we're introduced to Eddie's mother, Monica, our lead from part two. She tells Eddie to kiss his father goodnight and produces Rob's head, which Eddie kisses. On the next day, we see Eddie at work. A couple of his colleagues, Bruno and an unnamed fellow, watch from afar calling Eddie a freak as he explains to us the perks of his job. Cracking open the coffin and greeting the corpse inside. Cut to that evening as Eddie logs onto a website where it seems you can sell body parts. He's joined by Monica and tells her that Bruno is watching him like a hawk. Monica says she'll deal with him but Eddie says he can fight his own battles. They express their love for one another and then we cut to the city where Eddie meets up with his girlfriend Roberta. They're planning on moving away together but Eddie is worried about leaving his mother. Roberta is under standing, saying that she's close with her mother too. She asks if his dad is still around and Eddie responds, partly, but we never talk. He's never been present. Roberta once again expresses her love for Eddie as he continues to worry about his mother. Behind him, we see a memorial for Peter Fetcher, a real person who died trying to flee East Berlin. The inscription reading, he just wanted freedom. Cut to the graveyard, midnight, as Eddie digs up a new body and sucks on its eyeball. He's seen by Bruno who confronts Eddie saying he's going to call the police and in a panic, Eddie decapitates him, much in the same way his father did to the gravedigger in part one. Eddie catches the head and smiles as we cut to him dismembering the body in his bathtub. Eddie plans to sell the parts on his site and thanks Bruno for helping him be able to achieve his plans with Roberta. Monica then presents a lampshade made out of Bruno's head which Eddie compliments her on. He then rushes to log onto the site as we cut to the police investigating Bruno's disappearance. The cop asks to view their CCTV and on the footage they see Eddie leaving with a corpse. Cut to Monica turning on her new lamp, the bright light shining through Bruno's eyes. The cop asks for Eddie's address as Monica introduces Rob to Bruno. Cut to Roberta trying to call Eddie but he's busy cutting up Bruno. Cut to Roberta outside Eddie's flat coming to check on him. There's a knock at the door and Eddie screams to his mother not to open it but she does so anyway revealing the cop. He asks if Eddie is there but Monica says she hasn't seen him in a few days. The cop then hands over his business card and asks that Eddie get in touch with him as soon as possible to answer some questions. She closes the door and Eddie loses it, screaming at her for getting involved in his business and never listening to him. As they argue, Roberta walks in and discovers Eddie brandishing a blood soaked sore. We see Roberta's eyes as she takes in the horrific sights of Eddie's apartment. Cut to the cop driving as he wonders to himself why Monica referred to Eddie as a he. Eddie is a female. Cut back to Eddie and Roberta as she asks who he was arguing with. Eddie says his mother, but Roberta is confused. But there's no one else here. Suddenly, Roberta understands. This all makes sense now. This is why you never introduced me to your mother. She's dead, isn't she? My god, Eddie, I have to get you out of this place. 
Eddie then tells her they can't leave without the baby as the cop decides to turn back and find out exactly what's going on here. Cut to Roberta entering the baby's room and finding it dead in its crib as Monica screams for her baby Eddie. Eddie is your baby? Your dead baby? Monica sobs as the cop arrives at the front door and draws his gun. He then bursts inside and arrests Monica. Cut to a psychiatric hospital sometime later as everything is explained to Roberta. In her mind at least, she was keeping her son alive. She could not accept his death. I believe this is why she surrounded herself with corpses, to try and reconcile her feelings with death, with her son's death, with the death of her Monica personality. I truly believe Bruno's was a one-off spur of the moment killing. There is no evidence she hurt a child. If anything, she could have loved him too much. She became crippled by guilt. We don't know who the father is? No. My belief is the baby was an unfortunate victim of sudden infant death syndrome. Of course, all this is just my feelings on the matter. We can't truly know what happened. The police have a huge undertaking sifting through the evidence. I understand there's a lot of body parts. Roberta asks if she can speak with Monica and is allowed into her padded cell. Inside, Monica apologizes and says she loves Roberta, with Roberta reciprocating the feeling. Cut to Monica's front door as Roberta attends with her mother. She's there to pick up Monica's things and thanks her mother for breaking the law with her. They break in and start to look around with Roberta being surprised that none of this shocks her mum. The mum then starts to explain that she had an ex that... <gasps> what? Mother? Mum? Betty? It is then revealed that Roberta's mother is Betty from part one, having named her child after Rob. After all these years, they are reunited, and that's when Betty tells her daughter that this is her father. The end. Well, holy f***ing sh**, right? What a ride. When delving into the world of extreme horror, Necromantic is a series that pops up time and time again. This is due to the fact that, on the surface, these films are about having sex with dead people. An action most of the world's population agrees is not exactly a hot move. Granted, the sex scenes in both films are repulsive in almost every way, featuring gooey bodies, slurpy sound design and close-up camera work, but the films are more than just these scenes. Underneath the bodily fluids and decomposition lie a tragic character study in a comedy coffin buried in the grounds of a romantic novel graveyard. And I'm here for it, obviously. The thing I find strangest about these stories is the presentation of the main characters and their desires. At no point does it seem like we're supposed to treat Rob and Monica as villains. Apart from all the murders and that, the first two entries in the series feel like straight up romance films and if you switched out the dead body for a living breathing person it would hit all of the conventions to rest comfortably in that genre. The most interesting character in the series is Monica, battling with her duality and desire to lead a normal life and f dead people, all the while painfully aware that she won't be able to do both. With her job as a nurse and relationship with Mark, the character clearly puts the feelings of others before her own, and is willing to become someone she is not in order to make others happy. Hers is a life of unfulfillment and compromise until the end of the film, wherein she decides to put her own emotions first. Rob, on the other hand, I see less as a character and more as a metaphor. As previously mentioned, the intent behind the first film was to stand up against the German Film Censorship Board and their unfair treatment and restriction of German filmmakers. With that in mind, the first film can be viewed as a metaphor for a filmmaker struggling to hold on to his love of cinema, even though the art of cinema seems to have perished long ago. To me, Rob is the filmmaker, the body is cinema, and Betty is the audience. The filmmaker and loves cinema, even though it is, for all intents and purposes, dead. His desire for film is such that he will continue to love it no matter what condition it is in. The audience also loves cinema, but seeing as it's their money that decides whether or not a film or indeed filmmaker is successful, they are effectively stealing it away from the filmmaker. Once the film is out there, it is no longer yours, leaving the filmmaker to not only mourn the death of something it loves, but also in the end have it taken away, leaving him alone. It's also interesting that Rob brings Betty a cat as a peace offering, the cat representing creativity. Now with the audience having abandoned the filmmaker, he violently destroys his creativity, leaving him to experience happiness one more time before eventually fading away. Betty's berating of Rob can also be seen as the audience's expectations of the filmmaker. The audience chastising the filmmaker for not having the courage to stand up to the powers that be. Or maybe it's just about dead people. The comic book continuation of the story is a much more straightforward affair, essentially giving us an epilogue as we catch up with the living and dead characters from the films. The theme here is one of cyclical tragedy, with the events and actions mirroring those of Rob's and Monica's some 20 years later. It seems that even if Monica had chosen Mark, she never would have been able to escape who she really is, and was always destined for that small white padded cell. One unexpected aspect of the series is the comedy. Now, I mentioned this a few times in the run through, but I think Necromantic 1 and 2 might be two of the funniest horror movies I've ever seen. The sheer absurdity of some of the events taking place here are hilarious once you've stopped being sick into your own hands. And with the presentation, I'm 100% convinced it's intentional. 
Also, the scene with Betty being too late to dig up Rob had me in stitches. It's important to highlight the humour here as it helps to understand the director's intention as it seems amidst all the death and misery, films can still be fun. Look, cinema may be dead, but you gotta laugh. And f*** it's dead body. I think it's no surprise to any of you, but I highly recommend the Necromantic series. They're challenging stories to sit through for the first time, but once you crack the crust of the necrophilia creme brulee, you gain access to a cinematic experience that's rewarding in its own little way. Also, they're not really about this, but the films are technically competent. The second film is way better, and you can see that Jorg has matured as a filmmaker in the time between the two. So that was my review of the Necromantic trilogy. Have you seen it? If you have, let me know in the comments below how many times you threw up. And thank you so much to the YouTuber Wendigoon, whose channel you can find in the description below. He recently did a video on extreme horror and shouted me out in it so yeah man massive thanks i really really f appreciate it from now on we're going to be on a weekly schedule with these extreme horror reviews and next week we're going to be covering the film murder set pieces it's basically if tommy was so directed a slasher film i can't wait to tell you about it anyway in the meantime thank you all for watching my name's john joe lyons and don't f dead people